everyone. First of all, huge thank you for sticking with us today. When they gave me the news that this would be the last breakout session on the last day, they quickly also told me that they like to save the best for last to make sure that everybody stays there. I still don't know if they told me that to make me feel better about myself or if it's true, but we will do our best to hold it true today. So I will get off the stage in just a couple minutes because I've got three of the most knowledgeable people there are about Copilot for Microsoft 365 with me. But before I kick it over to them, a few housekeeping things. First, what we're going to be talking about. So we've broken this out into three sections. The first will be focused on Copilot orchestration. So a little peek under the, wood, uh, under the hood of how Copilot works. Where does the data flow? How does the data get there? How does Copilot do these magical things? We're going to break, unlock a little bit of that magic for you. Second piece is around in-app data flows. So Copilot does some incredible things in the apps that we know today. It can create decks in PowerPoint. It can create new beautiful drafts in Word. It can even do conditional formatting in Excel all via natural language. But how? So Dave will give a little bit of a background on that. The last piece is around customization and extension. Heard a lot about Copilot Studio this week. Going back to May, we heard a lot about extending through th things like graph connectors and message extensions. In this session, we want to bring all of that together to give you a, f a complete picture of what options are available to you to extend and to customize Copilot. Lastly, we've got microphones on either side of the room. We hope to leave about 10 minutes for Q&A at the end. So please line up and make sure you're getting your questions answered before we leave. So before diving in, a quick step back. I love talking about this to topic of how Copilot works. And that's because it does this little thing that is so helpful for me inside of Microsoft, it, when I'm talking to customers especially, in that it demystifies what feels like a really complex topic. It helps users get more out of the product when they know how it works, but more importantly, for people like you in your shoes, it helps to build that trust and that confidence that you understand the product before trying to implement it or push it in your organizations. So I've spoken with probably 100 customers to this point since we launched Copilot in March. There's always a part of that conversation where their eyes light up and they say, ah, I get it. And I hope to be able to create that with you today. So I wanted to ground the conversation on two of the topics that we hear most often. The first is, how does it work? And the second is, how can I extend and customize it? The first question comes from a good place. We, to some extent, are naturally skeptical about new technologies, especially when they're as new as this, and especially when people like Microsoft, or groups like Microsoft, are claiming it's as transformational as it is like this. Admittedly, I was skeptical. I had a lot of questions when I first saw it. The good news is the answers to a lot of those questions are really simple, and we'll talk through those answers today. The second is around customization and extension. We have talked about Copilot as being a Copilot that is with you through your entire life at work. We mean that. But we also realize that people's work isn't only contained in the Microsoft Graph. So how do we connect it to those other services, and how do we extend it to make all of that available within Copilot? Just as important at how it works is where are these questions coming from? And again, every time I'm talking to customers, if they ask a question like, how does it work? How does the data flow? How do you commit to X, Y, or Z? Or if they ask, how do I extend it? How do I bring more data in? Before answering, I really want to understand why they're asking. Are they coming from a place of skepticism or concern? Or are they just curious? Is there a service that they really know they need to get in Copilot to get the most of it? Or do they have some misconception that you need to extend it to be able to get any value from it? Being able to answer that why has helped set me up for success of then going into the details. And again, I hope to be able to help you on that journey as well. Last point, I want to ground on some principles we'll talk about today. The first is that Copilot inherits the Microsoft 365 commitments. We built Copilot on a platform of security. It was not an afterthought that we had to figure out how to add it in at the end. A big part of the way that we did that is that we borrowed and leveraged the existing infrastructure and architecture of Microsoft 365. That inheritance is a lot of what uh, Mary will talk about in a few minutes, but a lot of what helps to drive the trust story that we continue to talk about with Copilot. The second is that Copilot can be customized and extended to expand value. I mentioned it a second ago. It is not a prerequisite for value, but it's a way to expand value. By connecting to different services that you have in your ecosystem, you get more out of Copilot. 
And the good news is we have lots of different ways to get there, from low code to pro code to extensions to plugins and things like that. And Ben will be talking a lot about that in a minute. So without further ado, I'm going to have Mary come up, and she's going to talk through some of the Copilot orchestration. Well, thank you all for being here. My name is Mary David Pash. I am so excited to be here today to talk you through how Copilot orchestration works. I am principal product manager on the Copilot engineering team, and we build the platform that our experience, all the Copilot experiences are built on top of. Before I jump into the flow, I really want you to make sure that you walk out of here feeling like you understand how Copilot works so that you know what you need to do to get your organization ready for Copilot, and so that you have the confidence that your organization is ready for Copilot. And the thing I want to address first are some of the concerns and some of the, the topic that comes up the most when I talk to customers, and that's all around data protection, security, and privacy. At Microsoft, the way we build AI follows our responsible AI ethical framework. And this really permeates our culture and how we build product. I hope that as we walk through how the flow works, how orchestration is happening, that you get a good sense of how we built in the responsible AI principles into every layer of orchestration. And as we walk through the flow, there are a few things that I want you to remember. The first thing, is that your data is your data, and that means it's yours to own and control. The second is that we do not train the foundational large language models on your data. And the last piece is that your data is still protected by Microsoft's comprehensive enterprise compliance and security controls. And that last point is probably the most important one. People hear about you know, GPT and LLMs, which have really taken off in, um, in the last year. But we've been building the platform for Copilot and Microsoft 365 for decades. In particular, we've been investing in how do we keep your sensitive content secure. And all of the investments that you've been making in keeping your data secure accrue directly to Copilot. So there are a few things you should think about when you think about how Copilot works and how it protects your sensitive business data. The first piece is that Copilot is all within the Microsoft 365 compliance boundary. Uh, people hear GPT and they're thinking that somehow uh, they don't have control over their data, that it's going to go somewhere that they, they don't understand. But we're using large language models that are in the Microsoft 365 compliance boundary. And those are private instances of the large language models. The second really important piece is that the data that Copilot has access to is limited to the data that you as a user have access to. So Copilot is not able to somehow elevate your access or maybe even generate um, insights on data that you don't have access to. And this is really important. It makes the, the third point here really critical, which is access controls. You can control what people have access to in, in Copilot by controlling what they have access to using our data access controls. I worked for many years in SharePoint Permissions, so I get really excited about this because this topic was important before LLMs, and it's even more important now. So make sure that you're following Microsoft's best practices for ensuring that your organization's data is only shared with the people that it should be shared with. Uh, in particular, earlier this week, there was a session that talked about um, how to get your organization ready for Copilot. Purview has some great features and mechanisms that allow you to prevent oversharing with things like DLP, sensitivity labels, and other policies that you can set up for your organization. So I highly rec recommend taking a look at that when you have a chance. And the last piece here, just to call out, is that users have access to Copilot, uh, users have access to data via Copilot um, for the data that's in their tenant. So it's, you're not going to have people somehow able to generate uh, insights over data that's outside of their tenant or other people outside of your tenant somehow get generating insights on your data. Um, now, now that you have kind of the foundation of how we think about protecting your sensitive business data in Copilot, um, I want to walk through the flow and some of the scenarios you could do. Um, one of my favorite scenarios with Copilot, and there's many ways to be productive, is being able to ask questions um, and getting answers to things that might be buried in your, tenant, uh, in your tenant's data. Um, and in particular, uh, I, I think this is really useful because today you can already do this. You can go to search, you can search through and see, uh, find all the content, read through a bunch of e emails or files to find the answer. 
But with Copilot, it does that for you. So as an example, you could be in, uh, in office.com. You can ask a question. Maybe I want to know what are the project milestones uh, for this Project Falcon that, that's coming up. And what Copilot will do is it'll search for all of your content across Microsoft Graph, the content that you have access to, to generate the response. And it'll actually list out, here's a list of project milestones for you. At the bottom, it'll also reference where it's generating that content. Um, and if you have something like Purview set up where you're labeling all your data to say this data is confidential, this data is general, you can see that you'll actually, um, in the references, it'll say what type of data was used to generate this response. And if you then want to go further and validate the references, you can actually open the file because it's listed right there in, re in the response and see exactly which slide in this PowerPoint deck it, the answer came from. So what's really happening behind the scenes here? Um, the first thing is that I ask a question, um, which is the user prompt, and this gets sent to our Copilot orchestration engine. Uh, the orchestration engine is what powers all of our Copilot scenarios. Um, but it doesn't just send your user question directly to the LLM. The first step is a very important piece, which is pre-processing. This is where the LLM does grounding. And grounding is the way that we get enough information to answer your question accurately. It's a big part of how we don't hallucinate. Uh, and the way that it gets more information is by calling Microsoft Graph. Simply put, Microsoft Graph is your data. It's your emails and your files, who you're working with, what you're working on, and all of that uh, context and relationship around that data. This is also the part where when you control what users have access to, Microsoft Graph honors that with Copilot. And so in this step, users only have access, and Copilot only has access to the data that you have, as the user have. Once the orchestration engine says, I have enough information to answer your question, it takes your question, the user, uh, the additional grounding data, and sends it in a modified prompt to the LLM to give the LLM enough information to generate a response. Um, there's also some other modifications to the prompt that we do here where we make sure that we're following our responsible AI principles, and I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in a bit. The large language model will generate a response. And then the next step, I think, is the most important step, which is the post-processing step. So we do additional grounding where we can call the Microsoft Graph, validate that the responses are accurate, make sure that we have the right references and citations, and also check to make sure the response isn't generating harmful content and is still maintaining our commitments to being ethical and fair. Once the once the orchestration engine decides that there's enough to give a good response, it responds back to the app. And this was a very linear flow um, that I showed you, but actually the orchestration engine um, is an iterative process, so it could call the graph multiple times and it can call multiple other skills. All of this flow that I showed you happens within the Microsoft 365 compliance boundary, and as you see, the large language models here are also our private instances that are within the Microsoft 365 compliance boundary. This flow is a pretty simple flow um, where you saw it, the orchestration engine gets some additional grounding data from graph. But what I love about the orchestration engine is that it can pull together um, multiple different skills to actually go from just chatting to actually commanding apps. So this is how we do things like generating an email for you or writing the document for you. And uh, Dave is going to come up here in a second and tell you how the orchestration engine can be more sophisticated. You can also make the orchestration engine even more powerful by customizing it with things like connecting it to the web data, public web data to give it up-to-date knowledge, adding additional grounding data with our graph connector story, and adding more functionality with plugins. And this is what Ben is going to walk through in a bit. Um, something to call out really uh, quickly here is that this can live outside of the Microsoft 365 uh, service boundary, and so this is an area where the admin has a lot of control over what they want to enable or disable, and then the users also will have a toggle to enable or disable it. But before we jump into that uh, complicated uh, flow and our kind of more sophisticated flows, I just want to call out um, a couple things that I hear a lot from customers, and that's around the Microsoft Graph. Uh, this is a really core point of how we actually get grounding data to answer your questions in, in Copilot. Um, and Microsoft Graph is, um, is your data, as I was mentioning earlier. The way Copilot has access to your data and the insights in Microsoft Graph is through Microsoft Search, which provides relevant search results and insights on top of your data. Um, if you've ever used email, like if you've ever searched for an email in Outlook or searched for a file in SharePoint, um, then you've used the Microsoft, uh, Microsoft Search. 
And we are constantly uh, evolving it, adding better relevancy, ranking, um, extracting insights and answers. All of those innovation will actually accrue to a better search experience, but it will also make your Copilot experience even more powerful. And because Copilot is built on the Microsoft 365 platform and on Microsoft Search, it means that you can control it with our existing Microsoft Search features and our existing security features. Um, you'll also see in a little bit how you can extend it with our, uh, the way that you can in Microsoft Search with graph connectors. Uh, the, being able to get the most relevant information from Microsoft Graph is really important because we leverage a technique called retrieval augmented generation. So I told you earlier that we don't train on your tenant data. So then how does the LLM have enough information to answer questions about your tenant data? We do this by having search finding that grounding data as we saw in the flow earlier. So you ask a question in the user prompt, we get some grounding data, but there are two other things that we send in the modified prompt. One is that we send chat history, and that allows the LLM to actually remember what you were talking about and have a conversational experience, since we don't actually train the LLM and it doesn't actually learn. Um, this is important for the user. It's also important to you as an admin because you're now able to actually um, uh, do features like e-discovery, retention, um, auditing on top of that chat session history. And the last piece here is the system prompt. Uh, Microsoft 365 has a default system prompt that gives Copilot responsible rules for interaction. This is things like where you should search for information, how you should cite your sources, um, but also things like style and tone and how you should act responsibly. This is how we ensure that we're not generating harmful content. And all of this, the user prompt, the grounding data, the chat history, and the system prompt all make up one large modified prompt that we send to the large language model to answer your question. The great thing about Copilot, though, is that it can go beyond just responding in chat and actually make you powerful by commanding apps, things like generating the email for you or creating a slide for you. And so Dave is gonna walk you through that complex flow in terms of how do we go from just chatting with Copilot to actually doing, to making you more productive with Copilot. Hey. Thanks everyone for being here. I'm David Conger from the Office AI team, and I'm here to take you a little bit deeper today on how Copilot works and can actually command apps. I focus on bringing Copilot into those applications, and for me, one of the things that's most important is how Copilot can help us take action to complete a task completely. And so I wanna show you commanding an action to start out. Now, we've all been in this situation. We've written a long, extensive document only to be asked to turn it into a PowerPoint deck and present it quickly. And this is something that Copilot is very apt to help us with. It can help do it for us and get us started. It processes the document that we have. It can outline along the way so we can see what progress it's making on generating the deck for us. It even can create speaker notes. So from that rich content, you also have a rich deck that you're ready to present. And in not too long, a whole presentation full of content is ready for us to start iterating over, including designs from designer. I can keep taking the next steps through Copilot, iterating a natural language, asking it to create an additional slide for me of something I think maybe it's missed or needs to be included. And I can even ask it to make revisions to the slides itself, changing colors or changing functionality within the slides, uh, just using Copilot to interact with the PowerPoint presentation that it created. So one of the biggest questions I get when folks see this is, well, how does Copilot actually drive the app? So let's demystify that a little bit on how we actually accomplish this behind the scenes. There's a few things that we need. The first is we need the current state of the document itself or the application that we're working with. We need the content that's of course gonna get generated and created by Copilot. And we need a safe execution flow. And I know this is important to many of you on how we actually interact with the app to produce that final content and create that content in the app. Now, when we start talking about this, a lot of people immediately jump to, likely how we do this is by using a general purpose language like Office JS and asking the LLM to create code for us in that language. But this presents a series of problems. First, the language is far too low level. It's very verbose in what it creates, and it's hard for us to manipulate and validate. Second, we know that LLMs are prone to hallucination, and this becomes a problem when the code seems correct, but quickly can be found to be wrong. 
And it opens up a lot of surface area. OfficeJS and other native languages are really powerful. And there's some things we don't want the LLM to be doing within the application at this point. And so with that, what we really find that we need is we need to separate concerns. The LLM itself is very good at intent understanding. It's good at solving certain types of problems. And our APIs are very good at executing within the app. So how do we do this? Well, we leverage symbolic references to entities. We need to make sure that those are encompassed in what we're creating. We also need to make sure that we're not losing track of being able to create complex flows. We know that a, a human developer could do this within a native language, and we need the LLM to be able to do this, again, within a safe way. And finally, we do need to be able to detect and recover because we don't have an active group of developers developing this. We need to find problems and fix them before we execute the code. Program synthesis is the method that we use to do this. We keep the LLM abstracted from the code itself, and then we use transpilation to end up generating the code and executing it on the client. For us, we've created a DSL, a domain-specific language we call ODSL, or the office domain-specific language to do this. We dynamically construct prompts, and we translate the natural user intent into a DSL program. It's easily authored by the LLM. It's very clear how it can create this, and then we can generate consistent code from that DSL to be executed. So let me briefly walk through the major components that you see here so you can understand the data flows a little bit better and how the execution happens and how we keep things safe. First, we do an entity classification. We wanna understand which types of entities we're gonna to need to interact with, either to make changes to or to generate within the content itself. And we wanna determine how relevant the document context itself is. You saw that in some of the examples earlier. The slide I created, for instance, didn't require any document context, but the later manipulation of a slide that I already had did. As we move into construction and synthesis, there's a few things to take a look at here, which is we take basically a five-step process through preparing the prompt for the LLM. The first is the rules itself that the LLM needs to abide by. The second is that syntax guide for ODSL, because of course we need to teach it what it can and cannot generate. Now, we want to keep the prompt as tuned as possible, and so we have a large prompt library of potential types of DSL that could be generated. And so we use that with the previous step, the analysis that we did, to find code samples that might be most relevant to the LLM. This allows us to keep that package very small that we send up and targeted for the prompt itself to just the types of actions that we think are most likely to be needed by the LLM. We, of course, also include the document context and the user query itself. And on the right, you can see that program synthesis getting generated. You'll notice a few things within it. First, there's a level of uniformity in the code. Similar statements, it's easy to read, it was easier for the LM to produce. And you can see these patterns if you look across the different apps that are getting generated as well to see that it, it is a very similar concept across apps. Second is the syntax is very compact. Quite a lot is happening here in a small period of time. We've really optimized on both ends for tokens in and tokens out to try to limit the amount uh, that we need to utilize within the system. And finally, we're very document context aware, as you can see the fields and properties and data being manipulated into the program synthesis here. And in the final step, we interpret and execute. This is where we transpile into native APIs like Office JS and execute on the client itself. We control permissible statements in this flow. So we only allow certain types of code to be generated from the DSL, protecting us from things like file write actions, which we don't need to do. We also have rigorous syntax checking and validation to make sure the program is correct before we try to execute it. And we can even correct buggy code because of how the DSL works and how the DSL uh, is manipulated, we can make sure that corrections can be made on the fly, again, before we execute. And so, very quickly, the DSL is generated and executed on the client, and at this point, we have a robust, safe, and verified program to complete the task. I'm gonna invite Ben up to the stage. Uh, while we took this low-level view into how commanding works, Ben's gonna take us through how now you can extend Copilot to your needs. Ben. Thanks, David. <clears throat> Morning, everybody. Um, so, yes, at the beginning of this talk, Kevin said there were basically two things you needed to understand. One was how it worked, and the other was how you could extend and customize Copilot. So I'm going to close this session up by talking about extending and customizing Copilot. Um, let's start with why. 
I think we're going to go through a why, and then we're going to go through a what, and then we're going to go through a how. The Copilot for Microsoft 365 has a certain set of, let's say, baked-in skills and baked-in data, right? It has a set of skills that it knows uh, that are related to productivity uh, around the emails and PowerPoint presentations that David just showed us, uh, uh, Outlook, Teams, all these things that are part of your productive day but don't necessarily encompass the entirety of your productive day. There are going to be other things that you're going to want to do in your organization. Uh, for example, there's accounting functions, there's sales functions, there's legal functions, there's all these other things that require skill and that could be incorporated into your, into your co-pilot, but they're not necessarily part of the Microsoft 365 suite. The point is, you can actually bring those things in. Similarly, you can also expand the set of knowledge that, that Copilot has access to. Right? We talk about having access to the grounding data that is in the Microsoft Graph or publicly available data on the internet. But you guys have all kinds of other data sources that could also potentially be used to further ground what it is that Copilot can uh, understand about your organization. For example, uh, uh, PDF files or uh, items from, say, uh, Azure DevOps, right? There's all these different things that you can bring in to expand that base of knowledge that Copilot can look at uh, in order to provide you with richer, more relevant responses. And then I think the other point that I want to make, and Mary has talked about this uh, at some length, is that you can do this and leverage all the work that we've already done to make you know, Copilot work the way that it works. Uh, all the work we've done with responsible AI and governance and our boundaries of security, uh, our UX, all the things that we've invested in, because it's a platform, you can leverage that and get more value, which is again something that Kevin alluded to, uh, from the extension and expansion of the Copilot for Microsoft 365. So that's the why. Now let's take a few minutes to talk about uh, the how. There's basically two ways. If you want to extend skills, if you want to say add legal skills to it or add sales skills to it, uh, you build a plugin. And a plugin is a really simple thing. It's essentially an API uh, plus a manifest. And the API is the data that it will take in in sort of uh, runtime. And the manifest describes the skills that you're going to uh, enable in Copilot uh, that will interact with the LLM. The other way to do this is to expand the baseline of knowledge by building a Microsoft Graph Connector. And Mary told you about the graph. Well, this is a way of indexing data from third-party sources and bringing it directly into the graph into that 365 service boundary where it is then managed uh, uh, as part of your Microsoft 365 tenant with our commitments. And so that's actually a very powerful way to do things. And I want to pause here because I think it's important for you guys to understand a little bit more about the distinctions between these two things. When I'm talking about a plugin, I'm talking about something that is deployed to individual users, right? And that is generally great for, you know, runtime interactions with often like structured data. When I talk about Microsoft Graph connectors, I'm talking about something that I think the word I want to use is persistent. That's probably not the right word, but I want to say it's persistent. It is something that is deployed at the tenant level by your administrator and is uh, bringing in data that becomes widely available to everybody once your administrator has actually enabled it. So there's this sort of idea of runtime individual user uh, interactions versus persistent uh, tenant-wide interactions with data versus skills. So think about that, and we'll talk a little bit more, I guess, as we go along or in Q&A if you have questions about that. So skills and knowledge, plugins, and Microsoft Graph Connectors. All right. We're going to walk through how these things work a little bit. Let's talk about plugins first. So obviously, the first thing you do when you interact with a plugin is you're going to ask a question in the UX that's, a, that's going to invoke a plugin. So let's say, for example, that we're asking about something uh, that requires a skill that Microsoft 365 doesn't have. Let's say it's a ticketing system or something like that. So do I have any work assigned to me? Well, the Copilot service is going to go out there and look, and it's going to say, well, I don't necessarily know this skill, but do I have a plugin that does this? And it's going to go look at that catalog of plugins, and you can see I have like Poly for polling and Adobe for documents and Smartsheet for documents, and there's priority matrix as well. That catalog is going to return available plugins to the Copilot orchestration system, and it's going to look at those and say which one of those actually can do what uh, the user has asked me to do based on my interpretation of intent. And so it's going to look at this and say, okay, priority matrix is the one that I want. 
uh, and it's going to generate a plan for responding to me. It's going to pass it through you know, the process that you saw Mary outlay, and it's going to execute that and return me a, a natural language output that tells me what it is that I have in priority matrix in a natural language way, and that's the basic flow. Obviously highly simplified and stylized, but that's what you guys need to know. Okay, so that's plugins, and I saw some phones go up, so I'm gonna just give you a second to take a picture of that, uh, and then I'll pause, and I'm gonna click. Okay, so now let's talk about Microsoft Graph Connectors. Um, actually, let me back up for one second and say, plugins are actually now in public preview, and if your organization is interested in starting to deploy plugins, it's an opt-in process. Uh, there is a link that we can share with you uh, that will allow you to actually opt into that process and start deploying plugins in your organization. All right, having said that, let me go back to Microsoft Graph Connectors. These are actually generally available, and we've actually had Graph Connectors out uh, in the world for, I think, about two years now. So the idea with a Graph Connector is, as, as, as Mary said, and as, as I've sort of alluded to as well, you're indexing data and bringing it into uh, your Microsoft 365 tenant, and you're essentially augmenting the graph and you're doing this at a tenant-wide level. Literally, your administrator goes into the, I think it's called the Security Intelligence Blade in the Microsoft 365 Admin Console and can turn these things on. There are a bunch of pre-built connectors, but you can also roll your own if that's what you want to do. When you light a connector up in your tenant, you're not just lighting up the connector for Copilot. It's actually powering a lot of other interesting experiences, a lot of rich experiences, like search like the Microsoft 365 app. It's, in, it's giving more context and more data to Viva and to Context IQ. So even if you are not necessarily already rolling out all your licenses for Copilot users, you do get a ton of benefit from rolling out graph connectors even before that. And then once Copilot comes in, you bang, you get that extra value as well. So I, I just want to emphasize again, this is a tenant-wide deployment when you do this everybody gets the benefit of a connector when it is connected. The other thing I wanna make sure you understand is that the data that you bring in, the access lists, the labeling, all those things are preserved when you bring them in. So it's not like you're just gonna take a bunch of data that used to have permissions and it all gets stripped out and somehow just dumped in for everybody to find. Those permissions, those capabilities are preserved as you bring that data in with your connector. All right. Let me wrap up here and talk about the how. And this is the tooling slide. This is a pretty oversimplified view of things, but I'm gonna to try to explain it as quickly as I can. If you want to build plugins to put skills into Copilot that it doesn't have, you can do it with ProCode and with low-code tools. The Microsoft Copilot Studio that you've heard a lot about this week is a great place to go get started to building plugins that, as I said, will bring data in that individual users can use and can use with the LLM. Absolutely the right place to start. You can also build plugins with our professional coding tools. Visual Studio, and particularly with the Teams Toolkit extension, is where you can start building plugins like uh, Microsoft Graph, uh, or sorry, Microsoft Teams uh, message extensions, for example, are the sort of the canonical example that I'd give you. So plugins can be built with low-code or pro-code tools. I recommend that you start with the low-code tools, and then if you need to customize, uh, work in the ProCode environment. Microsoft Graph Connectors, at least at this point in time, can only be built with ProCode tools. So you will go to Visual Studio, you will get the Teams Toolkit, you can build these things. I'll pause and remind you that there are a lot of pre-built connectors, things that you don't necessarily have to worry about. Um, so you can look at those as well. Okay, so I'm gonna leave it at that and say, um, I'm gonna call my colleagues back up to the stage for a little Q&A, there's a slide that you guys can take a picture of with a bunch of calls to action and resources. And while we're at it, let's give the uh, sign language guys a hand for everything they've done at this event. It's amazing to watch them, right? Um, but uh, Mary, Kevin, David, let's uh, come back up on stage and open up the microphones. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Well, people are hopefully walking up to the microphones with questions. I'll, prompt, or I'll prime you with a question that I had this morning. So we were thinking about this session. I'm like, oh, what are we gonna do if no one asks questions? What questions should we start with? So I decided to go to Copilot. And I said, Copilot, what, and Copilot says, what can I help you with? I said, what are some of the most common questions we're getting related to how Copilot works? 
It's a long answer with a lot of, with four different citations. Some of the most common questions we're getting are related to, uh, the, the, related to data processing, security, privacy. For example, users want to know how Copilot interacts with their organizational data, blah, blah, blah. It also says additionally users are interested in learning what resources and best practices are available for using Copilot. That was one question we didn't answer. So I said, hey, cool, great question. What's the answer to that? And it said Microsoft's perspective on the adoption of Copilot is that there's an ongoing, it is an ongoing process, not just a single moment. To ensure successful adoption, Microsoft has created resources such as the Microsoft 365 Copilot Adoption Guide Workbook, which provides high-level overview of the adoption framework. It also talks about the Prompt Toolkit. It also talks about Copilot Lab, with citations for each of those as well. So anyway, we've got people with the mics now. Just wanted to also give you a little bit about adoption and show you some of the power of Copilot in action. Please, first question. Decks and Word Docs and stuff. Um, is that going to be available to plugins? So, can I write a plugin that modifies a PowerPoint deck? That's a great question. I don't have anything to talk about in that area at the moment, but it is an interesting place that we'll want to follow up on because I'm guessing a lot of people will want to extend how the apps are actually manipulated. Like this today, they mostly focus on the chat experience. What about the rest of the integration that we have in the compiled apps? Do you foresee that the plugins will come to the apps? So if, if I'm in Outlook and I'm writing a new app today, no plugin integration, and those it takes quite a lot of it's very limited compared to the compiler. Yeah, I think the answer is actually the same as the one that David gave, which is to say we really aren't quite ready to talk about that yet, but I certainly know why you want it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Got a question around general availability. So Microsoft seemed to have redefined that term, given that it's only available to organizations of over 300 seats. Is there any sort of timeline to open that up to medium-sized businesses, sub-300 seats? Yeah, and Copilot didn't tell me someone would ask that, but I knew somebody would. Um, <laughs> we've got, so the, <clears throat> excuse me, the most recent guidance on that is online. We are, have launched our early access program for small and medium-sized businesses, which was an invitation-only program in much the same way as the general enterprise early access program was. We will have more to share soon. I've got nothing more to share on that today, unfortunately. I will say for, there's also people, there's a version of that question which is also, my organization has much more than 300 seats, but I only want to try it with a small handful. And that one is a bit of a different answer. And I think one of the big things that we looked at when making that decision is we looked at our early preview customers and we talked to them, especially leaderships and people, leadership and people executing the program. One of the things that we learned is the ability to have a forcing function to get more broad and diversified usage across their organizations did two things. One is it gave them a better sense of where the value could come from. So it wasn't just a small pocket that used it and said, eh, it's not really related to my work. It gives a more diversified sense of where value could come from. The second piece is it got people talking. And we've noticed this inside of Microsoft as well. The more people are using it and the more those users interact with other people, we see multiple, uh, we see kind of a scaled value of what people are getting from because you learn from others, you're inspired from others. So being able to start that flywheel or kickstart that flywheel has been massively important for early preview customers, which is another reason that we wanted to encourage that higher seat minimum. Let's go over here. Good job. Uh, thank you for the insights. It's very helpful. Uh, so when we say the enterprises data, the LLM is not getting trained, uh, I'm sure it is, it'll be there in the documentation as well, but for audit purpose and for the security reason to prove, um, is there any way to see the proof that it is not getting trained? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. So today what we have, so we're persisting the session history. So you can see, um, specific, so um, when you interact with, with Copilot, you ask a question and Copilot gives a response that has references. And so all of that uh, chat history now gets persisted so that you as the admin could then do things like e-discovery on top of that. So you can see that type of thing. Now, I, I think some people are a little bit worried that the large language model will somehow um, remember or, or learn. And so they're like, hey, 
give me evidence that it's not learning. Um, the large language models are stateless. And let me tell you, I wish it was that easy to just train a large language model and say, and now this is your, your large language model. Um, but it really takes a lot of effort to, to do that training. It doesn't ha happen automatically. And so um, for the large language models, they're stateless. The, the way that you can see kind of what is being fed to the large language models is, um, is through the chat history and some of those particular features. Back over here. Yeah. Um, so my question was about if it's possible to, you know, when we saw the PowerPoint presentation, can you instruct it to follow the company's guidelines and, and branding requirements? Um, and is that also possible in Azure and stuff like that as well, where it's released? Yeah, we do follow the capabilities through designer and including allowing for brand toolkits and uh, other materials to be included. And yeah, we'll definitely continue to look and understand what customers want around customization and being able to pull that data in and have Copilot take account for those. So, so doing it right now would be really complicated at the current stage. Right now, it'll output whatever designer is able to handle with regards to the style of the presentation itself, and you can help direct Copilot in your intent of what you want things to look like and how you want them to look to give it that, that guide, but we'll continue tooling on it to make sure that it can and do that. And we did on the first day we announced that images, so corporate approved images are part of, or will soon be part of the package for Copilot and PowerPoint as well. So I can ask Copilot and PowerPoint to insert an image that's part of my corporate library and it can access that as well. Um, go back over here. Hi. Um, my question was around Copilot Studio. If we wanted to use Copilot Studio to um, expand our connections and so forth, uh, what type of licensing requirements would that need? Um, one, to build something in Copilot Studio to connect to external data sources, and two, for the users to make use of that. Copilot Studio will be included with Copilot for Microsoft 365. Um, so that was part of, also part of that initial announcement on the first day. Um, and I would say look back to that, and then we've got online documentation, which is probably not, not in one of those links, but we will, and we already do have some online documentation to give more details behind that as well. Okay, thanks. Yep. Hello. Whoa. She yeah. said speak loud. <laughs> <laughs> so, two questions here. Um, I submitted my question here via this QR code. There's a handful of other questions there, and I'm just not sure, it, will we get notified after the session um, with respect to responses? We will look yeah. into that. I don't okay. know. There should, okay. be, there should be people working in the chat. So, yeah. All right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, second question. So my understanding is that the LLMs won't be trained uh, using our data. Will the co-pilot service use our data for its own training? And is there an opt-out process, especially in like the GCC high DOD, you know, Azure Gov instance, when it, when it gets there? Will there be an opt-out process? It's a good question. I am not going to speak to that, not because I want to be evasive. I want to make sure that we get the precise right answer. Okay. Um, and I don't have that answer with me right now. Okay. All right. Thank you. I apologize. You. Yeah. You've, you've put that in the chat, right? It's in the chat. Okay. Yeah, so we'll, we'll yeah, up on good. That one. Thank you. Uh, just a real quick question. One of the requirements, from what I understand, with the Microsoft apps, it requires uh, you to be basically on uh, current channel. Are there any plans to extend that to uh, semi-annual? We've extended, we've announced, I believe that we've extended to monthly. Okay. Semi-annual, I don't have details on. Okay. So Thank we're you. getting closer. Um, last question we've got, it says a minute left. So okay. a quick one and we'll get your quick answer. Uh, quick question. Uh, it's a follow-up question to Copilot Studio. According to the online documentation, you would just rebrand the virtual agents to Copilot Studios. And according to online documentation, you need a SKU for virtual agents. So, and at the same time, you say, well, it's included in a Copilot license. That is feedback that I will take and we'll look into that. Okay, to clarify thank you. That. We'll update documentation. Apologize. Hello, question about uh, the plugins and extensibility. How does Copilot maintain the security between other systems that may use different users? I mean, it's effectively, in many cases, calling APIs that, so for example, if you install a plugin for ServiceNow, it's effectively calling the exact same APIs that you've already approved because you own ServiceNow and you have, you know, the same security policies apply. We actually vet those apps when you publish them, so there's a permission and validation process where we go through and 
scrape. You know, we go through a, a, a whole store validation process when the app is published to make sure that it not only complies with our existing standards for, say, a Teams plugin, but also all the other uh, security uh, and and uh, compliance uh, uh, policies that we've established, largely in line effectively with OpenAI. So that same set of parameters is uh, is applied to the evaluation of every uh, of every plugin that's submitted. But how does it know who am I in ServiceNow in this scenario? I'm sorry, like what sir? permissions I have in ServiceNow? So how the permission is passed oh, from ServiceNow act, to Azure Active Active Directory. AD. So yeah, it needs to be AD. single sign-on yeah. base yeah. applications? Or yeah, it, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. Basically, your identity uh, is required in order for you to get to. So there is a common understanding that it will be able to uh, inherit SSO slash OAuth. That's okay. The, and is there a licensing for these type of connectors? or? No, they're third party, right? So the licensing for connectors will generally be established by the third party. So the license would come from, ex in the example I just gave, ServiceNow or from whoever it is that published that connector. And obviously, if it's internal, you don't have a licensing issue. And so, I think, yeah. oh, sorry, we are getting told that we are out of okay, time. Yeah, the we'll big still be around, coming. so we can um, follow up. Yeah. Thank you, everybody, so much. All right. Really Thank appreciate you so it. Much. Thank you. Safe travels home. <laughs>